for those who don't know me, I am, um, my name is Scott, I'm a senior pastor here at All Things Like Baptist. It is wonderful to be with you all. Um, and so for those who do know, this, as I said earlier, this is um, our fourth week looking at Moses. And uh, this week, um, we've, I've titled the message, uh, The Burning Bush and the Reluctant Rescuer, mostly because I like alliteration. Um, and, and earlier, um, I got you to talk about this question, when have you had to do a job you felt unprepared for? And I think on Father's Day, um, many of us who, who are here in the store, gee, yeah, children is certainly something that we just had to do that we really weren't prepared for. Um, and uh, so that's definitely something that sprang to my mind as well. Um, I'm not going to um, go around the room and ask you what all your answers were, but you can tell me later if you'd like. Um, but I want to um, show you this guy. This is Guy Goma. And uh, this week it was announced that he is suing the BBC. Uh, now, he's not suing BBC, okay, just, just, just so you know. He's not suing BBC, um, our friends down the road. He's suing the BBC. And is that ringing mic? Is that, is that me? or It's unusual. Okay. I apologize if you hear a ringing sound too. He's not suing um, BBC, although, you know, if they change their name to the BBC, then that might get even more confusing. But the British Broadcasting Corporation, who have made uh, money at his expense due to their own error. So it was their fault. Um, uh, they made it an error, and then um, they make money off him for their fault. In 2006, Guy arrived at the BBC um, for a job interview, and he was waiting at reception. They were waiting there for his interview, and someone came in to get Guy for his interview. So they came into the reception and said, Guy, I'm ready for your interview, and he's like, okay. And why he didn't question what was going on um, when he was in the makeup department, we may never know. You know, if you go for a job interview and they start putting makeup on you, you might go anyway, but no. He was totally unprepared for what came next. On live television, he was asked questions about a judge's ruling between the two apples um, so and the potential impact on live streaming music. So if you're not sure who the two apples were or are, uh, one belongs to the Beatles and one belongs to Steve Jobs. So, you know, they're both pretty famous. Anyway, there, there was this judgment made. And then when the presenter introduced Guy Goma as Guy Cuny, the horror registered on Guy Goma's face before he spent the next 90 seconds trying to bluff his way through his interview. The first question she asked is like... <gasps> Were you surprised at this ruling? And he was like, I'm very surprised that you're asking me about this ruling. I was not expecting this. Anyway, to add insult to injury, after arriving late to his actual job interview, he didn't get the job. Guy Goma was totally unprepared for the job. But sometimes, even though we are prepared, or perhaps prepared enough, we still don't feel ready. Last week, we noted that God uses our character, personality, and life experience to prepare us to participate in God's rescue. This week, I want to, us to remember that God commissions us to join in with God's rescue regardless of the reasons that make us unsuitable. Exodus 3, 1-6 says this. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in awe. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing. 
Moses said to himself, why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face, because he was afraid to look at God. So, many years after the encounter at the well in Midian, we find Moses doing the job that his wife, Zipporah, used to do, looking after his father-in-law's flock. And the Bible says that Moses took the flock to the mountain of God. This is Sinai, where God appears to Moses at the burning bush, where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, where water flowed from a rock when Moses struck it with his staff, and where Elijah meets God in the small, quiet. But because none of that has actually happened yet, I wonder, was this the mountain of God before God met Moses there? Or was it the mountain of God because God met Moses there? Now, it's actually a bit difficult to tell which mountain it actually was. There aren't any signposts where God didn't leave any writing there to say this is the one. Um, One of the leading contenders is the mountain that bears Moses' name. It's called Jabal Musa. And uh, so, as you can even see from that picture, uh, there are lots of similar mountains nearby. It's one of them. And I've often wondered, uh, why a burning bush? Why does God appear in a burning bush? But... um, Actually, this this week, I've looked at quite a few photos of the area. And if we look at the photos of the area where we think that Mount Sinai was, it looks like God had the option of using a burning bush or a burning rock. Uh, The area is officially classified as a desert uh, with an average rainfall of just 21 millimeters per year. As a result, very little growth. But perhaps in spring, during the snowmelt, there might be just enough water in the in the valleys to produce grass for flocks of, of sheep and goats. God gains Moses' attention. And as he draws near to the burning bush, God tells Moses to take off his sandals because it was holy ground. And I always wondered um, how Moses didn't burn his feet. Because he's in the desert and it's hot over there, eh? Uh, But given the altitude and the climate variation, he was probably, I discovered, he's probably just as likely to get frostbite as burn his feet. Because while the summer highs um, can get to over 40 degrees Celsius, and so at that point you would burn your feet if you put your sandals on, um, the lowest recorded uh, temperature at St. Catherine, which is, yep, just there, uh, is minus 6. So if he was there at the wrong time of year, he would go first. But he's probably there in the spring, And it probably is actually rather nice. So he wouldn't burn his feet. Here's Moses. For all we can tell, Moses is the first person to interact with God in person since the days of Jacob, over 400 years earlier. And God is revealed to Moses as the God of his father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these heroes of the faith, these founders of the nation of Israel. The God who had made covenants with Abraham and Jacob is now speaking to Moses by name. Moses. Moses. And Moses is suddenly aware of being in God's presence. Which is a pretty powerful thing. And then, right then, we see what might be the first sensible thing that Moses does that's recorded in the Bible. He covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. 
Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. God gets up close and personal. Firstly, God gets up close and personal with Moses. How close to the burning bush do you think that Moses gets? I think probably maybe just a meter or so, just at, at conversational distance. Look at what God says. I have seen. I have heard. I am aware. I have come down to rescue. God is fully invested in this. And this is personal. God hasn't just seen reports of oppression or heard accounts of their distress. God has seen their oppression and heard their cries of distress firsthand. So, um, have we got time for a little theological aside? Um, Sue said I, I should just go for it. So, um, if if you don't, if I go really too long, um, I'll share the responsibility. It's all my fault. But anyway, so here's a question: Does God feel pain? Okay, so I'm going to do a quick fire survey. Um, who thinks that God feels pain? Good, good number. Uh, who thinks that God doesn't feel pain? Nobody. Very brave enough to say. Who isn't really sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's okay. And who doesn't like putting up their hands when I ask them? <laughs> you still put up your hand. It's awesome. Uh, okay. It's hard to be sure because after all, pain is first and foremost an embodied experience. The chemical and electrical signals that run from every part of our body um, to the spinal cord and into the brain, um, it's an embodied experience, and and God doesn't have a brain like we do. Um, Now, I don't know everything there is to know about pain. Everything I know, I I learned by reading Sue's essays when she was studying pain, and um, most of it went over my head. But God doesn't have a body like ours, so how does God feel pain? But this issue of whether or not we think of God as experiencing pain determines how we read this passage. So the Bible Gateway um, app, it lets me compare over 50 English translations for any Bible verse for free. And the translation of the last part of verse 7 falls into two distinct camps. So the first one, Um, has translations like, I know about their sufferings. I know about their pain. I'm aware of their suffering. I know how much they are suffering. I know all about their suffering. I'm concerned about their suffering. I'm concerned about their pain. I feel sorry for them. And the second camp has translations like this. I know their suffering. I know their pain. I know their sorrows. I know their pain and suffering. I know well their suffering. I know their sorrow and sufferings and trials. I really do understand their pain. So these two camps depict two different understandings of knowledge, or perhaps two distinct aspects of knowledge. And for now, I will call them theoretical knowledge and experiential knowledge. There might be a better word for each of those things, but hopefully you get the feel for that. Because both the English word for know 
and its Hebrew equivalent, the one that's used in the scriptures, can imply either theoretical or experiential knowledge. And because of that, it's hard to know which one God is talking about. And so we have to guess. And so some guess with this, I know all about it, and others, I actually know it. So the question is, does God know about our pain and suffering theoretically? Or does God know our pain and suffering experientially? I think so. so we're going to just go a little bit deeper. So first up, I think that God has a way of knowing that is beyond our capacity to know. So Isaiah 55, 9 says, For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So there is a possibility that God knows our pain in a way that we can't comprehend. So God might feel our pain in a way that we don't feel it, but still feel it. Maybe even more than we feel it. You feel me? But Isaiah, he says this of Jesus. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not fear. Yet it was our weaknesses he, he carried and it was our sorrows that weighed him down. So acquainted with grief and sorrow sounds like experiencing pain to me. And well, if, if we really want to proof text this, um, this is also one of the very first verses that, that many of us in church memorized. Uh, it's John 11.35, Jesus wept. So while I think that God might not have to experience pain, that God chooses to experience pain. And God chooses to experience our pain, our sorrow, and our grief. And so, therefore, I think that God has experienced the Israelites' trouble firsthand. And so God has come to rescue the people of Israel. God has come to rescue the people of Israel. And God has chosen Moses for the job. And, and so God tells Moses to be on his way. Off you go. Get on your bike. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. So, uh, time for another survey. Sorry for all those who don't like raising their hands. Hands up if you think if God appeared to you supernaturally, like in a burning bush or a burning any, there's so many other things, a burning car or a, a burning pole or a burning letterbox or a burning cat. Um, if God supernaturally appeared to you and gave you a job to do. Who thinks that you would go and do as you were told? You'd go and do it. Three, seven, or a few. Um, hands up if you would run the other way. A bit like Jonah. Yeah, there's some honest people here. Good, love. Wonderful. Um, hands up if you would try and get someone else to do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and you know, people are like, oh, I didn't know that was an option. Yeah, I want that one. <laughs> Hands up if you're not actually that sure how you might respond. In Exodus, we read, But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. So Moses, this great and revered spiritual leader, as, as David talked a couple of weeks ago, a large number of the faiths of the world revere Moses. Billions of people revere Moses. He gets a personal commission from God and in the words of the NLT, he protested a lot. It seems that he just doesn't 
think he's up to the job that God is asking him to do. And so his first protest is about his own credentials. Who am I? Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel? You know, it's it's pretty common for us to doubt ourselves, to think that someone else will be better qualified than us. Someone will be better connected. Someone will be better suited. And well, strictly, that's probably right. Because while nobody has your unique character, gifting, and experience. Nobody's just like you. But pretty much every single thing you do, even the things you are very good at, there will be someone out there who is better at it than you, even if it's cooking crumble. There will almost always be someone who could do the job better than you could. But God doesn't care. God commissions us to join in with God's rescue, regardless of the reasons that make us unsuitable. God effectively ignores Moses' protest about his credentials or his suitability because that protest, it misses the point. It's not about Jesus. God answered, I will be with you. God gets Moses back on track. It is God who is doing all the rescuing, not Moses. It's not about how qualified Moses is. It's all about how capable God is. Moses is effectively just going along for the ride, and eventually he gets a front row seat to one of the greatest demonstrations of power in all of human history. God commissions us to join in with God's rescue regardless of the reason that make us unsuitable. It's not about who Moses is. It's all about who God is. Which actually leads us to Moses' next protest. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. So Moses' second protest is essentially, but who are you? Because Moses goes from questioning, well, who am I? And God says, it's okay, I'll I'll be with you. And, And then Moses is like, but who are you? And God's reply is the ever- enigmatic, I am who I am, or if you've got one of those Bibles with footnotes, often these little asterisks and it says down the bottom, or I will be what I will be. Still not that much clearer. God self-reveals as the I am. And while I think that for most of us, it doesn't seem like a very good name, there is actually a sense of internal logic to this. In the Bible, those who come first name those which come after. And those who are greater name those who are lesser. So in the beginning, God named the day and night, the sky, the land and sea. And God names Adam. Adam names Eve and all the animals. And Eve names her sons. And then it seems that at any point it seems appropriate, God can change your name, Um, just for the fun of it. Uh, So just ask Abraham or Sarah or Israel or Peter or Paul. God changed their name. Because God is greater. But God, the pre-existent one, does not have anyone who had come before to ever bestow a name, nor will there ever be anyone greater that could ever give God a name. And so God is essentially self-named as the eternal self. I am. I think that for us, it's, it's easier for us to forget who God is than, than we realize. 
who this God is that calls us to. The same God who said, I have come down to rescue them, now go, also says, I am making all things new, therefore go and make disciples. Just like Moses, it's easy for us to forget that God is the one who has promised to act. God is the one who does the rescuing. God commissions us to join in with God's rescue, regardless of the reasons that make us unsuitable. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, What is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff, and it turned into a snake. And Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, really has appeared to you. So Moses' next protest is what if the Hebrews don't believe him? After first doubting himself and then doubting God, Moses now doubts the Israelite people that God is sending him to rescue. God promises to demonstrate miraculous signs, and, and Moses gets to see them right there on the spot. God commissions us to join in with God's rescue, regardless of the reasons that make us unsuitable. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what you say. Moses' next protest is that he isn't a very good public speaker, which might be true, probably is. He clearly preferred settling arguments with his fists in the past. And you know, today, at least three out of four people, and perhaps as many as nine out of ten, have some degree of fear or nervousness about public speaking. So there's a couple of different surveys I've seen and, and, and studies, and so depending on just how they articulate what it is, uh, are you afraid of public speaking? Three out of four. Are you nervous about speaking in public? Nine out of ten. And you know what? I reckon that that one other person might be lying. There's something that Moses says that we can sometimes believe without articulating. He says it, but, but often we don't. And, and the thing we believe, it goes something like this. If God really did want us to go and speak to Pharaoh, then God would make us good at speaking. You know the whole where God guides, God provides sort of thing. You know, we've heard those stories of the people um, who went to the mission field and miraculously picked up new languages really quickly. Or, or the provision of resources to go somewhere that God has called people to. But Moses says, I'm not very good with words. And I never have been. And I'm not now. I'm still no good, even though you've spoken to me. So Moses has an encounter with God, and God tells Moses to speak to Pharaoh. And yet, speaking in public is still a struggle for Moses. He doesn't miraculously get the gift of public speaking. But God's response is significant. It reveals the degree of God's control that we often fail to remember. God gave us mouths and tongues and vocal cords, lips, teeth, nasal cavities and diaphragms. Everything that we use to produce speech, 
were formed by God. God also gave us ears and the internal and external elements that enable us to hear. And God gave us the brain function to decipher and comprehend sounds that make speech intelligible. And God goes so far to say that it is God's call as to what people are able to speak, able to hear, or able to see. God is effectively saying, you could get up there and say gibberish, and my message would still reach Pharaoh's ears. God commissions us to join in with God's rescue, regardless of the reason that make us unsuitable. But Moses, again pleading, Lord, please send anyone else. Then the Lord became angry with Moses. Moses finally breaks. Lord, please send anyone else. It appears that not only does he think he's not qualified, unsuitable, won't be listened to, he just doesn't want to go. He would far rather God choose anyone else but him. When the call of God comes on our lives, I think a lot of us, we want to be like Isaiah and say, here I am, Lord, send me. But so often we are like Moses and we say, here I am, Send anyone else. We, we doubt our qualification. We doubt God. We doubt the people that God sends us to. And we doubt our ability. And by now, I'm not at all surprised that God got angry with Moses. This is the God that rescued uh, Moses from Pharaoh, not just once, but, but at least once, um, as a baby and as an adult. This God is speaking to Moses from a burning bush that isn't burning up. This God has just turned Moses' uh, just turned Moses' staff into a snake and then back into a staff again, uh, along with the whole snowy hand thing that we, we skipped over. God has chosen Moses to go. What part of go now, I will be with you, does Moses not understand? By this stage, if I were God, I'd be like, have it your way. Zap. Ex Scotus, chapter 4, verse 14. And suddenly the fire from the bush blazed ten times hotter, and Moses was engulfed by the flames and completely destroyed by the fire. But God is like me. God commissions us to join in with God's rescue, regardless of the reason that make us unsuitable. All right, he said. What about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he speaks well. And look, he is on his way to meet you now. He will be delighted to see you. Talk to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be with both of you as you speak. And I will instruct you both in what you do. Aaron will be your spokesman for the people. He will be your mouthpiece. And you will stand in the place of God for him, telling him what to say. And take your shepherd's staff with you and use it to perform the miraculous signs I have shown you. So Moses went back home to Jethro, his father-in-law. Please let me return to my relatives in Egypt, Moses said. I don't even know if they are still alive. Go in peace, Jethro replied. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and headed back to the land of Egypt. In his hand, he carried the staff of God. I wonder if I've been giving Moses a bit too much of a hard time. Maybe Moses just doesn't want to do the job on his own. As soon as God says, okay, your brother can go too, Moses is straight back to Jethro and off to Egypt. There are a couple of things that are reassuring about what God tells Moses. The first is the most obvious. Having somebody else to share the load with you, to talk with you about what's going on, and to tag team on the presentation is way less stressful than having to do it all by yourself. And, you know, personally, 
I'm a really big fan of teamwork. Teamwork makes your dream work. No iron team. Together, everyone achieves more. All of that kind of stuff. Big thing. But the other thing is perhaps more meaningful. God says that Aaron was already on his way to meet Moses. God had spoken to Aaron to go meet Moses before God met Moses at the burning bush. When we know that God is speaking to other people about the same things, we have a much higher sense of confidence that we really are hearing from God correctly. Even the great prophet Moses, who God spoke to face to face, is comforted by the fact that God has spoken to someone else. And if God has spoken to Moses and Aaron, God will speak to the elders of Israel and to Pharaoh as well. God commissions us to join in with God's rescue, regardless of the reason that make us included. So, last week, when I finished, I got everyone to talk about this question at the end. How might God be calling you to participate in God's rescue right now? And I know that it was a hard question, a little bit unfair. Um, this week's question is probably just about as challenging. But still, I, I, I want you to have a go. Have a chat with the person that you came with or you're sitting near. Two minutes before you grab a cup of tea. What part of God's rescue do you feel unqualified for? but might be with someone else. And who might that be? Let's pray. Lord, even as you had spent 80 years preparing Moses for this commission, he didn't feel ready. Lord, even as you appeared to him at the burning bush and met with him face to face and told him to go, he still didn't feel ready. Jesus, you call us to go go into all the world to make disciples, to proclaim your good news. And Lord, so often we don't feel it. Lord, I, I do want to thank you that you, you don't listen to all our excuses. But Lord, that you do encourage us to go with others. Lord, I thank you for the work that you are doing in each one of our lives as you prepare us to take part in your rescue. And Lord, I thank you that even when we feel unprepared, Lord, that you help us to call to you and we find others on the journey who are, uh, who are just as scared as us, but willing to participate with you. We thank you that you give us one another to do that. Lord, I pray that as we seek you, as we talk together, you would reveal to each one of us the part of your rescue that you call us to. And Lord, those who you call us to join with in that. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, I know I was longer... Um, you can blame me. You can send me emails later. Um, please um, stay for a cup of tea and coffee. I know many will have Father's Day lunches and afternoon teas and dinners to get to. Enjoy them. For those who don't get to do those things, pray you would know God's blessing with you today as well. God be with you this week. Have a great week. God bless.